Okay. Do you want to go ahead and share those this first slide? Can you not? Oh, did I not share the screen? Sorry. Not quite yet. Yeah, sorry. Hi, welcome everyone. We will get started in just a minute. Perfect. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am a Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And I'm very pleased to welcome today Julia Costa Domingo and Rowana Walton with the U UN Environment Program, oh, World Conservation Monitoring Center. Um, and we're, they're gonna be speaking today about the global state seascape restoration, progress needs and opportunities, some recent uh, study that they conducted. Before we get started, um, I wanted to let everyone know that um, we'll have a time for questions and answers after the presentation. Um, you can send in questions through the question panel, and we encourage this, it's a little bit easier for us to see the questions, but um, you can also use the chat freely, as long as it's on the topic um, that we're here today, that you can post questions that if you wanted input from other attendees um, in the chat, you can also post resources people might be interested in on this topic, and you can um, answer other questions with your own knowledge. So we do encourage you to use the chat as well um, during the webinar. Just make sure if you want if you want something that just for the presenters and I to see, you send it to hosts and panelists. But if it's for everyone, that you send it to everyone. Um, and we you can send in questions throughout the webinar, uh, but we'll hold substantive questions till right after the presentation. Okay, Julia and Rowana, thank you for being here, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thank you everyone for joining us um, today for this webinar. As Sarah said, we're going to give you a short presentation on um, the global state of seascape restoration, progress needs and opportunities, um, and after that presentation we'll have time for a question and answer session. Um, so please feel free to put those in the chat or save them for the end. So, oh, excuse me. Um, just to give you an overview of what we're going to cover today, um, we're just going to introduce ourselves and the organisation that we work for, talk a little bit about what is Seascape Restoration um, and why did we look at this approach in our project, um, the approach taken in the project, some of our key findings, um, and then talk a little bit about the opportunities from this project, as well as having that question and answer session at the end. So we're here to talk to you today about the output of a project. Well, that your sound is a little, um, it's sounding different than when we tested. Can you? Oh, okay. Can you um, just bear with me. There was a little bit of static there. Sorry, Sarah, yeah, I've just had to close the presentation just for a second whilst I try and work on the audio. Okay, and the audio sounds okay now. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's strange. Um, yeah, it's on the same setting as it was before. Let me try again. Um, or maybe I'll move it a little bit closer, see if that helps. Okay, how is the audio now? 
um it might be back well carry on we'll see how see how it goes okay um, um i try to talk as slowly and clearly as possible so yes we're here to talk to you today about the outputs of a project that we undertook called endangered seascapes which was undertaken by a team last year at uh, the united nations environment program world conservation monitoring center um, or unet wcmc for short so unet wcmc are a global center of excellence on biodiversity so we ensure that science, knowledge, and insights shape global and national policy and collaborate with partners all around the world to build capacity and create new innovative solutions to some of the environmental challenges that we're facing. So we operate as a collaboration between the UN Environment Programme and the UK registered charity WCMC. So two members of the project team for the Endangered Seascapes project were myself, Joanna Walton, and a colleague with me today, Julia Costa Domingo. Um, and this project was funded by Arcadia, um, whose, one of whose goals is to protect the natural diversity of the world, and their grants help to safeguard and restore unique and biodiverse areas of land and sea. So um, we're just going to drop um, in the chat now the link to the website, restorationfunders.com, where you can look at the report from the project and the database. If you haven't looked at that or seen that already, we'll refer back to it at the end. Um, of the presentation, but just so if you want to take a look now, you can. Everyone, try backing up from the microphone a little bit more. Let's see if that helps. Is that any better? The, um, while you have the presentation open, I'm not sure why it would be related. We're, we get a little bit of feedback. Oh, okay. It might also, my computer's also making some awful noises. Um, let me just see if we can do the sound from Julia, if it's any better. One second. Okay, that's good. Is this better? Um, speak a little bit more, Julia. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm hearing some feedback. Yeah, there there is a little bit of feedback there as well. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you try speaking, Rowana? Is that any better? Um, Rowana sounds okay right now. Yes. Is that better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, let's try and continue. Yes, okay, go on. So, uh, what is seascape restoration? So, in this project, we adopted the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, restoration Definition, which is uh, that restoration is the process of halting and reversing degradation, resulting in improved ecosystem services and recovered biodiversity. So this can include both act restoration actions, um, let's say such as planting a species, such as planting of mangrove seedlings, or more passive restoration actions, such as area-based management tools like marine protected areas. So that's defining restoration, but what do we mean by seascape? Well, currently there isn't really a formal definition of seascape. The term is derived from landscape and it can be used to describe a complex marine area different interacting species and ecosystems that are shaped by dynamic and interconnected processes that all operate at different scales, a range of scales in space and time. And this, the spatial scale at which these interactions can occur can vary depending on the location, the species that are present, and the nature of the human pressures that are also present. So what, what is then a seascape restoration approach? So a seascape restoration approach that can again, is still not clearly defined, but it, it, it can account for the variety of ecological processes that take place in coastal marine ecosystems, which, as I said before, are very dynamic and highly connected. So when taking this seascape restoration approach, you can consider multiple habitats, and that means that the actions that you take can support larger, more integrated strategies to restoration, which can account for the fluidities of these ecosystems that are unlike terrestrial ecosystems. This approach can also be advantageous because you can consider the impact of anthropogenic processes and activities. So often these um, activities can occur many miles away from the coast or coastal areas, such as you know, it can be things such as upstream dams or agriculture or forestry, which can all impact these coastal areas and marine species um, as well as the associated ecosystems. And so they can then be encompassed and considered as part of the wider seascape. 
So that was a little bit about what seascape restoration is, but why was this project needed? So as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's been a growing development of international restoration commitments and targets as um, society and governments have become increasingly aware of the ecological and economic and also societal benefits from restoration. So some of these more um, recent commitments and targets include those such as the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, um, which under target two commits to 30% of degraded areas, um, including marine and coastal ecosystems, to be under effective restoration by 2030. And then we also have more recently the EU Nature Restoration Law, which is expected to come into force uh, next year in 2024. So the increased desire and awareness of actions resulted in the mobilisation of considerable funds that can support national, regional and international commitments. But at the moment, we don't really have a full understanding of how these funds are being distributed or used. So through this project, we hoped and aimed to gain a much better understanding of where and how funding for seascape restoration is being allocated. So this, we hope, will support the strategic and efficient distribution of these funds ensuring that we can undertake, um, or we all can undertake evidence-based restoration projects that will have the maximum impact towards these ambitious global targets and commitments that, are, that have been made. So within this project, these were three of our aims. So we aim to understand the nature of current and recent large-scale seascape restoration projects. We also wanted to understand the funds that have been committed to seascape restoration projects and the sources that these funds came from. And we wanted to look at the political commitments and targets to implement large scale seascape restoration projects um, that had been made. It's important to note at this point that this project was undertaken as a scoping exercise to get a um, baseline understanding of the state, state of funding for seascape restoration. Um, and was by no means exhaustive. So that is to be considered when we discuss our results and the approach that we took. I'm just going to hand over to Julia now. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, Rana. So yeah, I'll just give us a quick overview of the approach we took to answer those three um, main questions that Rana just presented. So to understand the extent and nature of seascape restoration projects and how they're being funded, we undertook a desk-based review of large-scale marine restoration projects across the world. Again, like Rana said, this was not intended to be an exhaustive review, but rather aimed to highlight key seascape restoration projects to give this indication of the current funding landscape for marine restoration. So the space study um, was undertaken by doing a review of both existing databases of restoration projects, such as the Global Environmental Facilities uh, Project Database, Upland Europe or the Society for Ecological Restorations knowledge base, to name a few. And this was complemented by some targeted Google searches using key search words relating to seascapes and restoration. Projects were selected um, from both these reviews using four key criteria that we have highlighted here on the slide. So they were projects ongoing or completed no earlier than 2015. So between 2015 and 2022, which was when this project took place, then they had to be projects uh, undertaking restoration action. And this was determined by looking at project descriptions and seeing if they used keywords relating to restoration, such as recovery, enhancement, or rehabilitation. Then we um, selected projects that were deemed to be large scale. Again, um, as Rana mentioned, there is no agreed upon definition um, for what a seascape is or what large scale is, and this will depend on uh, the location and habitats being restored. So we determined this on a case by case basis. And then um, of course the projects had to be restoring coastal um, or marine ecosystems. And then for each of these projects that we selected, we collected um, some general information, firstly on the project um, where it was taking place, the partner types involved, and then also on funding details, including the donor, the beneficiaries and the total amount of funding. And we also captured some of the details of the restoration activities taking place, including the habitat types that were being restored using the IUCN um, habitat classification scheme, the goals of restoration, ecosystem services supported, and the restoration measures applied. 
one thing to note is that um, all this information was not always publicly available for, for all projects, or at least not easily accessible. So there were some um, gaps in these categories for some of the projects. This information was collated within a database of seascape restoration projects, which is available online. And alongside the development of this database for seascape restoration projects, we also undertook um, review of relevant policy commitments for seascape restoration to answer that third question Rana presented um, on identifying relevant policy commitments for seascape restoration. And to do this, we conducted a review of key policy documents, again, complemented by some targeted Google searches. And we only included commitments made by governments. So we excluded commitments from non-state actors, such as the private sector and NGOs. And we included commitments at the international, regional, and national levels. So um, at this stage, commitments at the subnational level were excluded from the scope. Um, and both the information about the commitments and the information from the database was used to inform a synthesis report on the progress needs and opportunities for seascape restoration, which is also available on the link that we shared. And we invite you to please have a look at the report and its annexes for more details on the methodology. Um, so yeah, well, let's jump in to the findings of this um, review. So overall, we identified 237 relevant projects over that seven year period between 2015 and 2022. The funding information wasn't available for all of them. So it's important to note that now when we quote figures, we are quoting them from a subset of projects which did share funding information. And these were 133 projects. So just over half of the projects and combined, they had a value of 3.35 billion. And the funding for individual projects ranged considerably from 9,300 euros up to 736 million euros um, for a single project. Next slide, please. So who are the funders um, of the projects that we identified? We identified 161 different funders in our database, which were um, categorized in four different groups international bodies, such as the European Union through their LIFE program, for example, or the Global Environmental Facility, national governments, including different governmental departments and agencies, uh, the private sector, um, such as, for one example, for example, Carlsberg um, was one of the private sector companies that funded some restoration work, and foundations, which we um, took to include NGOs um, and non-governmental organizations. So international bodies um, and governments funded the greatest number of projects, as you can see in the bar chart here. And they also provided the most money as shown in the donut graph there on the right. And who is receiving this funding? So we identified 185 different beneficiaries and these were classified in the five different categories that you see here on the right. Non-governmental organizations were beneficiaries for the largest number of projects, as shown in the bar chart, followed by governments and then research institutes. In terms of uh, the amount of funding, governments actually were the ones that received the greatest amount of funding, followed by NGOs. Next slide, please. So that's who is funding and who's receiving the funding, but where are these restoration projects taking place? So the projects we identified took place over 127 countries across seven different regions. The largest number of projects, which is shown here um, in the map on the left, were in the United States, then the UK, and then Italy. In terms of the amount of funding shown on the right, it was the United States, Pakistan, and Indonesia that received the largest amount of funding. And this might, this is likely because they also had three of the highest uh, funded projects. So for example, Pakistan had the has the 10 billion trees program, which includes the restoration of mangroves. Um, and this was valued at 736 million euros. So it's the highest funded project and might explain why it came out on top when looking at total amounts of funding. Um, and yeah, so again, the value of funding received in each country and region does not relate to the total number of projects being undertaken because of this reason. So for example, in Western Europe, which had the highest number of projects, 
the majority of projects were relatively small in scale and had lower levels of funding. So when looking at amount of funding, it's Asia Pacific that received the largest amount. Next slide, please. When looking at the habitat types that were being restored for these projects, coral reefs were the most frequent target of restoration with 67 projects um, restoring coral reefs followed by mangroves and then seagrass beds. There were 16 other habitat types um, using that IUCN habitat classification scheme again that were restored um, by the 117 other projects that we looked at in the database. Another thing is that 53 of the projects actually restored across multiple habitats and the most um, common combinations were coral reefs and seagrasses followed by coral reefs and mangrove forests. Of the 237 projects, again, only 133 had that funding uh, information available. And when looking at this subset, mangroves received the largest proportion of funding, over a third of the funding, followed by coral reefs and then salt marshes. Uh, a last thing to note is that the projects uh, identified in the study were all restoring coastal habitats. So this indicates um, that large scale offshore deep sea uh, habitat restoration projects are relatively rare at the moment. Next slide, please. Looking at the types of restoration measures um, being used by these projects, we classified restoration measures into two categories. So there's active restoration measures, which involve a greater degree of human intervention and include things like transplanting native species or removing invasive species, and then more passive restoration measures, which involve less human intervention and uh, include things such as reducing pressures through the establishment of um, area-based measures like marine protected areas. And these two categories do lie on a continuum and are complementary, but the dichotomy can help understand the types of activities that are being funded. And as we see here, active restoration was the most common type of restoration activities um, used to restore seascapes, followed by a combination of both active and passive measures, and the least amount of projects um, used only passive restoration measures. Although it is important to note that this might be because of the nature of the review that we used to inform this project. So it might be that projects that purely use passive measures such as protect marine protected areas or fisheries closures do not um, classify their project as necessarily being restoration or do not classify these actions as restoration actions, despite them um, potentially restoring um, species, populations and ecosystems in the area. Next slide, please. In terms of the project goals, where restoration goals were specified in projects, which was um, not always the case. We classified them into five different categories, biodiversity conservation, climate adaptation and mitigation, research, and then supporting other ecosystem services. Um, the most common goal stated on project um, websites was biodiversity conservation, um, which was actually mentioned in 88% of cases, and it was also the most funded. And then this was followed by climate change adaptation, where just under a quarter of projects mentioned this as a goal, with a smaller proportion uh, mentioning climate change mitigation or research. Those were the following two most common. And then when looking at other ecosystem services um, being enhanced, regulating services such as erosion prevention and moderation of extreme events were the most frequently recorded. Next slide, please. So that's for the project um, database. For the um, review of restoration related policy commitments, our aim was to identify where restoration action is high on the political agenda and who um, was committing to restore uh, seascapes. So we identified 105 restoration related commitments or targets. And this included both commitments on marine restoration specifically, as well as commitments on restoration more broadly, which also include marine ecosystems. This included targets um, and commitments at the international level, including targets under international agreements, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, 
as well as commitments at the regional level, so, such as those made under EU conventions or, for example, the Pan-African Action Agenda on Ecosystem Restoration for Increased Resilience, which has a target um, to restore at least 200 million hectares of critically degraded ecosystems of various types, including marine habitats and mangroves by 2024. And commitments um, were also recorded at the national level from 49 different countries. And these were identified by looking at, for example, countries, national biodiversity strategies and action plans under the Commission on Biological Diversity, as well as other um, relevant national strategies. And the highest number of commitments were in Latin America and the Caribbean, followed by Asia Pacific, as you can see um, on that bar chart at the top. And over 50% of commitments identified um, a specific marine habitat that they were aiming to restore. And the most frequent um, of these were targeted to mangroves, as you see in the bar chart below. Uh, then followed by coral reefs, uh, seagrass, and wetlands. For example, just to quote one, um, Tanzania has committed to restoring 158,000 hectares of mangrove forests and coral reefs, as well as building scientific knowledge and technology as part of their delivery uh, towards the sustainable development goals. It is important to note that the most frequent coastal and marine specific uh, commitments were for supportive measures rather than for um, time-bound area-based restoration targets. So things such as increasing capacity um, and research for restoration. The least common types of commitments were funding-related commitments, so where um, actors had committed a specific amount of funding towards uh, seascape restoration, but some did exist. So for example, Spain has committed 26 million euros to supporting marine habitat restoration under their um, restoration and green infrastructure plan. One thing to note is that um, this desk space review happened last year. Um, so since then, since we concluded the review, there have been some um, significant new um, commitments on restoration. Just to name a couple, which Rana has already touched upon, we had the adoption of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which has um, targets dedicated to restoration, including the target to restore 30% of degraded ecosystems by 2030, which includes marine ecosystems. And then um, at the regional level, there's the um, EU nature restoration law, which looks likely to come into force um, next year and would also put in a target to put in place restoration measures on 30% of marine habitats that are not in good condition. And now I'll hand back over um, to Rana, who will summarize some of these findings. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, thanks very much, Julia, for presenting all of our, our findings and our results. So to bring us back to what we talked about at the beginning, where I outlined what our aims were um, for this project. So one of our aims was to understand the, the nature of current and recent large scale seascape restoration projects. So just to reiterate that we identified at least 237 seascape restoration projects um, across all regions. And there was a focus that we found on active restoration measures, um, on particularly on coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrasses. And when we looked at the funding that had been committed to seascape restoration activities and where sources of these funds came from, so as we mentioned earlier, we identified that there was at least 3.35 billion being used to fund seascape restoration. And this was mainly coming from international bodies and governments. And in terms of the political commitments, as Julia has just outlined there for us, um, the commitments and targets that have been put in place to implement large-scale seascape restoration projects. We've identified in this project over 100 commitments and targets that are relevant to marine restoration at an international, regional and national level. With, um, as we just said, um, the majority of those being identified in Latin America and the Caribbean region. So thinking about the conclusions there and also some of the findings that we had in this scoping study, what next and how can the findings of this scoping study be applied? So as we said there, the, the projects identified that there is certainly a, a, a growing commitment and determination um, to restore coastal and marine ecosystems. However, 
seascape restoration is still in its infancy. We still don't have um, a, an agreed upon definition. And, and this sort of uh, infancy can be a barrier in translating what are great aspirations into action. So one of the ways that we can overcome this barrier is to make sure there's complete transparency, complete transparency in what actions are being undertaken by who, and also the achievements intelligence um, related to these actions. So access to this information is paramount, and we hope that through the outputs of this project, we start to we start to break down this barrier. This will in turn help we support other evidence-based and planning and action, which can deliver. It's important that you know our focus here was really looking at funding landscape for seascape restoration, and obviously, um, seascape restoration, restoration in general, there are many indicators for restoration, um, and and a great deal of information that needs to be understood about what makes a, a project successful. And that wasn't within the scope of this study, but is also equally as important. But for this, we really wanted to just understand the funding landscape. So by producing um, a database of uh, the funding landscape, the seascape restoration projects, we hope that we've collectively improved our understanding of this um, current funding landscape. And this, this can help us guide future, how like future resources can be strategically allocated by a range of stakeholders to meet restoration commitments. So, for example, when governments are revising and updating their national biodiversity strategies and action plans, or when perhaps funding bodies are looking to identify priority areas for restoration actions. In addition, there remains a question of how we'll meet the funding needs of these ambitious global commitments and targets, um, and also national and regional commitments and targets that we've identified within this project. Um, estimates really vary of the funding that's needed to meet these uh, global ambitions to conserve and restore ecosystems, um, both terrestrially and marine. And it's not clear, even now at this point, how the current funding landscape will meet these needs. However, again, we hope that the results of this project will provide more information on, on what this landscape looks like or looks like at the end of 2022. Um, and ourselves, UNEPWC as an organisation, are collaborating with partners globally on how these partners can progress towards these targets, how they can utilise funding effectively, and how they can access the knowledge that's needed to take action to meet these restoration commitments and targets. So just to um, recap, we mentioned at the beginning, um, but we did produce, as a result of this project, um, we did produce an online uh, database with the results of the desk-based study. So this project database is um, hosted at restorationfunders.com by the Endangered Landscape and Seascapes program. And you can also access information on another ecosystem restoration in Europe project that was, um, was available on that website. Um, and then you can see here um, some just some snapshots of what the online database looks like if you haven't seen it already. So you can see that you can filter by the habitat type or the country or donor um, or the partner or the amount of funding that's provided. Um, if you then click on a given project, you can access more information. So that would include information on the goals, um, the region it was located in and links for further information. And the database can also be downloaded as a CSV file, so that allows you to explore it and manipulate it a little bit further. And then just a reminder, if you um, haven't already, if you go to that link that's in the chat, um, restorationfunders.com, then you can download the report um, from that page. You can access the database um, and also we encourage you to contact us, you can contact my uh, colleague, Julia, and that email address there, I'm just going to put her email address in the chat there, and also the links again so you can access those. Um, but please do um, get in touch with us if you want further more information or to discuss the outputs um, of the project anymore. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for listening, everyone. And yeah, we'll open up to uh, questions now. Okay, thank you so much, Rowan and Julia. Um, we really appreciate this presentation and we're, we're glad you are sh sharing your work. Um, I won't necessarily go in order with the questions, but there was one um, mentioned in a new journal called Seascape. 
um, they were wondering if your definition of seascapes was related to that, or whether you, and I'd ask whether you grew from that new journal or, or had any knowledge of it. Um, so no, I didn't. I was not aware of that journal, um, and our definition didn't did not come from that journal. Um, there are many definitions um, of seascape restoration and seascape. Um, several leading NGOs, international organisations, they all have a different interpretation of seascape. So ours was an agreed upon definition within UNEP WCMC based on some of those other definitions. Um, and based on that, we came on to our own agreed upon definition that we used and used consistently throughout this project. But thanks for um, the reference to the journal. We'll certainly have a look at that now. And thank you to, to Camila, who uh, mentioned that. Um, there were questions about whether you found projects in sandy beach habitats and also why kelp forest restoration was left out, left out of the review. I can answer that. Um, yes, there were some some projects on beaches. Um, they just weren't one of the most common habitats, so that's why um, it didn't come across in those figures. Um, but do have a look at the database, and there's some in there. And we did not um, help, but again, um, there weren't as many large scale projects um, looking at coralgal restoration, but there were some. Um, for example, um, Mercy's in the EU, which was looking at that as one of the um, of the habitats. I should see to utilize that online database on the website, and you can um, have a look there for um, any by the particular habitat you're interested in. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there was another question. What is the evidence that mangrove restoration was successful? Do you have any indicators? What I have seen is that less than 10% of projects are successful in Latin America. And so I would just ask also generally, um, did you see data on how successful the restoration projects were or um, were there any good studies along that lines? So we were mostly focusing on just the nature of the projects and the funding and not so much at their uh, success indicators. But from the review, it was quite clear um, that very few projects um, had or at least shared the indicators for success um, for their projects. That's one of the gaps that we highlight in the report. Um, so for mangroves, I don't think we identified anything specifically. But I see Emma um, in the chat has shared a guide on mangrove restoration, which might have um, some of that information in it. Thank you. Um, there was a question. Can you clarify again what makes a project a seascape restoration project and not just an individual coastal or marine restoration project? Was there a kilometer squared cutoff or integration into a broader seascape strategy? Yeah, so um, again, this, uh, no, there wasn't a specific kilometer squared cutoff because we were looking at um, uh, seascape restoration projects globally, um, as you can imagine, um, or as you, I'm sure you're aware, um, the ecosystem ex, um, area or expanse varies from country to country, i.e. in small island countries, you have ecosystems, um, multiple ecosystems in a very small area, very closely together. In other um, countries, uh, maybe more temperate countries, you may have larger ecosystem area with a much greater distance between them. So we didn't use a single kilometer squared area because we didn't feel that would be appropriate to the different locations. So, um, and and the for those, that, my colleagues that undertook the research, um, it was used as to use their best judgment based on that location um, and that area, what, can, what was constituted a seascape restoration project. And I think you raise a really good point that until we have perhaps a more agreed upon definition of seascape restoration, it is very hard to give an exact definition of what that area should look like. We know it should be of perhaps multiple ecosystems or interconnected ecosystems with anthropogenic pressures, but the actual spatial area of that does vary quite significantly between location. 
So I think there's certainly a need um, looking forward in seascape restoration for us to be, have a more cl uh, clearer definition um, so that these comparisons can be made more easily. Thank you. Um, a question, did you look at restoration of hardened shorelines like river and seawall? We did not, I think, include um, that type of restoration. Um, definitely an interesting one to consider um, in the future. Thank you. Um, and then I guess, I don't think it was included in your study, but if any, you had any thoughts about doing this in the future, um, is there a list of key threats to target in a seascape where halting a degrading action has greater impact? For example, fish enclosure and, and, raw, um, and raw sewage being treated. Um, and there was a similar question that was in the questions, but there was a similar question um, in the chat about whether um, prevention activities are more cost effective. You, what additional information would you want to see for that? Or do you have any thoughts on that based on, on the study that you did? So it's a, a great question and, and certainly not something that was um, covered in the scope of this study. So um, certainly not nothing from the results of this study um, can be pulled into that. But sort of from my own personal perspective, um, I would say that this is very location dependent and very much ecosystem dependent. So um, it varies quite significantly. You would need to do an assessment to every location to really understand what are the key drivers and key threats at that location. Um, I think I can see the colleagues are, are posting uh, things in the chat for best practice guidelines for mangrove restoration. These also exist for, for instance, for coral restoration and for seagrass restoration. So these, these sort of best practice guidelines can be a really good starting point but again, it, you know, it's one of these things that we don't really have a boat tax for multiple ecosystems and the interactions between them. But um, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to that. I think that an assessment would always need to be done at each location as to what were the most important drivers or pressures that needed to be tackled first. Thank you. Um, sort of on that topic, um, someone made the comment in the chat, uh, it will be really interesting to understand the approximate cost of active restoration for the component habitat types. How much is too much? This will help when applying for funding. Is it something that you've come across? So we were looking at total numbers of funding rather than the cost of uh, res specific restoration measures, say, per hectare or within a project. Um, and it was, it is kind of difficult to disaggregate that kind of information from total funding costs. So it's not something we specifically looked at in this project, but it's definitely uh, an area where we need more information. Um, and there's quite a lot of work on that. Just, yeah, from other things that I am aware of beyond this project, um, I, under the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, there's a task force on financing restoration, which um, the World Bank um, is leading on, and they're doing uh, work to better understand the costs of um, restoration measures, and that will include active restoration measures, and that will give a better indication of those sorts of figures, and equally um, trying to understand as well um, the benefits um, that come from that so that proper comparison can be made um, on those costs and benefits to inform um, future projects um, and yeah what is too expensive what isn't so I hope that's helpful yeah. I think that this is um it's a, it's a really great point and something that's highlighted again that a lot of the information that's publicly available on this is often summarized at a, a higher level or is not disaggregated so it's actually very hard to pull out this information so I agree that would be super useful but I think um, we need to sort of have a bit more of a movement to having more detailed information publicly available to really understand those um, sort of areas. And ultimately, it's very location specific, yeah. and that's always um, something that is a challenge when trying to pull out just general costs um, for a restoration action, but definitely somewhere where yeah, we could have a bit, bit more information transparency. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, did you find any projects or commitments of restoration located in international waters? For instance, for instance, restoration of corals, or is it only in national waters? I believe we only included national waters. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, um, no, as, as far as I'm aware, within the database of the project, it was only in national waters. Um, I'm not aware that any were excluded or whether just, um, I think just none were reported on in, in international waters. Okay. Um, another question, did you notice any projects noticeably integrated with other marine resources, re sorry, resource uses such as fisheries and aquaculture? I believe so, and there was also um, some projects linked to um, offshore energy development, for example, so that there were projects linked um, to other marine activities, um, definitely. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, um, as Julia sort of mentioned, some of the um, projects that are listed in the database are quite large, complex projects, um, and definitely had scope beyond just um, seascape restoration as well. So. I would encourage you, um, if that's something you're interested in, to take a closer look at the database. And there are, uh, there's more information on there, but also links to um, project and organization websites and further information where you certainly could find that information if you wanted to. Yeah. And I guess this is a good place to mention that, again, this is a desk based um, study and it's sort of a snapshot in time. So do visit uh, project websites for the most up to date information on projects because they'll, they will no doubt. Um, have been up, or many of them will have been updated uh, since we've included the study. Right. All right. Thank you. Um, and then we had a, a comment from one of the attendees pointing out that in the area beyond national jurisdiction are like deep sea corals, whereas um, the shallow coral reefs are in, are in EEZs. Um, another question that came in Did you look at funding changes over time? I know the study covered quite a few years. Did you see an increase or decrease in funding by year? Are there any trends that you saw in regard to this? So we, we did look um, at funding over the years that the, the project looked like looked at, sorry. And we found no trends really, but there is a section on that in the report and a graph that shows um, those differences year on year so so do have a look um but yeah we were also half expecting a trend but yeah and i think it's important to note that because as well um that that trend over time would it's slightly difficult to understand because um there were projects in there that ran for multiple years and projects that ran for single years and projects that started or completed within that time period so it's quite difficult to understand what the the sort of funding trend was. I think there was maybe a, a slight increase um, over the seven years, um, but not, not necessarily that significant. Thank you. Um, there was a question with sort of also a comment, um, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Do we need to be measuring human well-being outcomes from restoration outcomes as a way to link to rights holders? their tenure and access to enable stewardship of those seascapes in their territories. Sorry, can you repeat that question, Sarah? Sorry, my voice is hoarse. Um, let's see. <laughs> Do we need to be measuring human well-being outcomes from restoration outcomes as a way to link to rights holders, their tenure and access to enable stewardship of those seascapes in their territories? I would so I think, say, oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Definitely, and yeah, thanks for asking that. It is a very important question. And one of the key um, gaps that we identified as well in the limitations section of the report is that, yeah, we did not consider some important socioeconomic outputs um, when looking at the projects. And those are very important to consider also in terms of, for example, gender outcomes um, and yeah, social outcomes. Again, the scope of this project was was not to um, examine all of those indicators and outcomes of the project. But um, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with Julia that they are an integral part of any restoration project and should be considered as such. But that is slightly beyond the scope of, of this study. 
must still hear us. Sorry. Um, oh. <laughs> another question. Yes, my fault. Um, as scientists, ecologists, conservationists, what can we do with this information? And how do you suggest we can leverage this research to get more action and restoration projects in the field? Science and technology is there to restore habitats. How can we leverage this research and channel funding to get funding to restoration practitioners? Um, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so it's a, a really good question. And I, I think probably, you know, with the results of any um, study or project, we always want to know, okay, so what can we do now? And, and what can we do with this? What action can we take? Um, and I think what we what we were hoping to do was by build or starting to build this picture of what funding for seascape restoration projects currently looks like it would allow and i say us but yes exactly scientists ecologists and conservationists are slightly different from obviously funding bodies and governments um but how how can we use this information and information that wasn't available previously not in this sort of review basis um, in our restoration work. And I think what I would hope is that it shows us the areas that are being targeted by funders. It shows us the areas that um, have received a lot of funding. Now, whilst that doesn't predict where future funding will go, but it shows us the areas um, that have already been funded or that there is growing interest in. It also gives us access to a database of projects and uh, project partners that maybe didn't exist before. So um, all the beneficiaries for these projects are listed within the database. And that allows us as scientists, ecologists, practitioners to look at that database. And you know, maybe we have a project that we'd like to conduct in a certain area where we could look at projects by that region, perhaps contact those project partners to collaborate with them, learn lessons from them, understand what you know the outcomes of their project were. And, uh, Whilst that information isn't available in this database, certainly the, the list of projects that are happening is available, and that can be a good starting point to take that forward in future research collaborations or um, future partnerships to um, grow our restoration efforts. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came in, uh, that interesting findings. Um, most of the projects are in North America, but most of the commitments are in Latin America. So, do you have any explanation for this? I think it, it's, it is not possible from the study or the outputs of the outcomes of the outputs of the study to know what an exp the definitive explanation for that could be. Um, one of the, the possible plausible reasons could be that um, within Latin America and the Caribbean, there are a lot of, um, of islands. Therefore, there are maybe a, a greater interest in coastal and marine ecosystems and seascapes. There's also a high number of people that are dependent on those coastal and, and marine ecosystems for their livelihoods, for their economic security, for their food security. It could be that those are driving the political commitment, but I would say that to understand really why there are differences in political commitments, you would need to drill down into the political landscape of those regions much more in much more detail to really understand what's driving those differences uh, in political will there. Yeah, just to add a tiny bit on that specific comparison, North America and Latin America, I guess as well, we have to consider the fact that we are looking at national level commitments and there are more countries um, in that region. So that's an, another reason for that difference perhaps, um, but it's still, still an interesting finding. Thank you. Okay, and the question, it, I had to read it a couple of times but it's a, to understand it, but it's a really good question. Um, what proportion of projects were related to planning and capacity building versus on the ground active or passive restoration? And did you analyze the funding proportions to restoration planning and capacity building versus action? Sorry, our connection dropped and we missed that question. Would you mind repeating, please? Um, what proportion of projects were related to planning and capacity building versus Act, active or passive restoration 
And did you analyze the funding proportions to restoration planning and capacity building versus restoration action, whether that was active or passive restoration? I, just I guess how much was how much was implementation? How much was planning and capacity building versus implementation? Right. Okay. Um, as I understand it, um, Julia, that we didn't um, in the actions and goals, we did not list them under planning or capacity building, or they were not listed as such. So we only looked at the um, active and passive restoration um, goals that were listed. Now, I'm not sure if there were any lists of capacity building and implementation. I'm not sure for capacity, but there were some on research, um, so that there was um, that, and these were classified as um, passive, I believe. Um, you can have a better look by downloading the CSV and um, filtering by those, but I believe those were not as common since the passive uh, restoration measures across all projects were less uh, frequent than, than active restoration yeah. measures. Again, that's not to say that the projects maybe didn't include those, mm -hmm. that they weren't in the information that was publicly available to yeah. us. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the questions that came in, I think, points to an issue that this practitioner sees. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't know that it was addressed, but if you have any thoughts on it. Um, it was, the question was, unfortunately, many funding sources have agreements with large NGOs and, the, and then they subcontract to local implementers. How can this inertia be broken? I'm assuming the person asking would like to see more funding go directly to local implementers. Yeah, question. I'm not sure that we can really comment on that because that is um, obviously something that is related to the funding bodies themselves. Um, again, I think by producing this information, this database that allows this transparency and visibility of projects and who they are being funded by, hopefully outlines all um, practitioners and implementers where those funding sources are available. And I, I guess the only other um, approach that I would think of my personal experience would be collaboration. So um, whilst there may be, I, I'm not aware of this, but whilst there may be, um, you know, connections between larger funders and, and larger NGOs, um, I would hope that larger NGOs are collaborating with local implementers to support them for on the ground action anyway. And that is how our local implementers could access that funding through larger collaborations. But again, it's not something I think we can really comment on for this project. Um, thank you. And we have, we'll go with one last question and um, make it a general question, though it addresses some specific ones that came up. Um, did you see what resources are out there for finding funding to do restoration? Are there any sort of matchmaking services? I mean, certainly people can go, I think your work can go see and go through it and see who the major funders are for restoration project. But are there any other resources that you would suggest people look at if they are trying to find funding to for restoration planning or action? Yeah, so this I think is it's um uh a challenge that um, we face across the uh, you know, across the marine ecosystem um, sector and all those that are working within um, marine conservation and restoration is um, getting visibility and access to those fundings. I think um, being part of um, ecosystem networks, so uh, things um, such as um, the International Coral Reef Initiative, um, being part of um, Global Mangrove Alliance um, and other mangrove groups, but ecosystem specific, those networks and groups are really um, great at promoting access to funding or funding sources that are becoming available. But there is a resource of information for funding sources, and this is because it changes all the time. So, you know, even our project that ended in 2022, which at the end of 22, was up to 22 was up to date with all that funding information very quickly has become out of date so it, it's a challenge to 
keep up to date and keep finding um, uh, these sources of funding. But I would say that through experts, best networks, um, they are really valuable in accessing um, information on upcoming funding. And again, again, looking at things such as this um, online database, looking at where who, which the funding bodies are, um, the larger ones perhaps, or even smaller ones, and following their website, following their pages, and looking for funding calls there is also really helpful in getting access to those funds. And I think also collaborations. Um, collaborations are a great way to funding. Um, most funders want partners to collaborate, multiple partnerships um, um, in order to apply for institutional funding. So I think collaborations um, with other partners are really valuable in extending that network and access to different sources of funding as well. Okay, this is a great way to end. Um, thank you both, uh, Rowan and Julia. Thank you so much for this. We appreciate the work that you did um, and we appreciate you talking about it. And we hope someone's able to take up um, the baton to, to move this research forward in the ways that you we discussed here and that the questions people raised. And I'd like to thank everyone who attended and thank you for your comments and sharing your own knowledge and for your questions. Um, I'm hoping to have um, another webinar sometime in the new year about some um, meta-analysis of seagrass restoration projects, which may answer some of those additional questions. Um, so I'm hoping that'll come together. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a great topic and, and we, we appreciate all of this high level work of sort of looking at the big picture. And thank you very much. And we hope both our presenters, Rowan and Julia, we hope you have a great rest of the day and we thank everyone for, for being here at the webinar. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks. Thanks thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.